shave that mouse, it's still going to attenuate about 80% of the signal because there's still a lot of black fur down in the follicles. So then you have to put a VEAT or a depilatory cream on the mouse and then it produces an inflammation response. So for example, you're dealing with a fluorescent marker that traffics the inflammation or you're dealing with stem cells that are helping with wound healing, guess where they're at? Now they're on this irritated skin. Yeah. So um, your best bet is Jackson Laboratories. They're a big mouse facility. They have multiple colonies, and they have an albino black six. So it's effectively a white black six, eight fifty seven. But they also have a nude albino black six C fifty seven. Um, the cost is a little prohibitive on that one. So you need to let them know eight weeks in advance. And then in the U.S., the price is about three hundred dollars for one of these black six eight fifty seven. So you're you know you're going to need quite a few. So we were talking about that and discussing that. And if for okay. meanwhile, we can start with the, with the black six. What are the old the odds that you will see a big tumor growing, like, like really yeah, but growing? If I'm you can still catch it. Though. I know, but okay, I'm a big mouth jerk, right? And I have a lot of opinions, and I'm like, the whole reason you got this machine is so that you can, instead of seeing a big tumor, you and I can see a big tumor from across the room. Why'd you get this machine? You saw it to see a little tumor, to see a micromet, to see a small number of cells. And instead of you waiting until you have a big tumor before you start your treatment, to start your treatment a month before that, and then scoop your colleagues, publish more in less time, work with smaller numbers of cells, don't have your mice dying because they have big tumors. So this is all just a little bit of planning and we can do it. A hundred, if you have them shipped to my house, I'll bring them down with. Like that's not a big deal for me. Um, just give me the correct paperwork so when I show up at customs, I'm like, hey, here, I'm bringing mice into your country. Okay. Well, we can try. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Cool. All right, we're going to talk about fluorescence, right? Everybody here is an expert in fluorescence. Everybody uses the microscope. When you use the microscope, you understand how fluorescence works, right? You don't? I'll explain it, okay? So you have a fluorophore on a cell or attached to a cell wall or in a fluid, right? And you're going to make that fluorophore visible. So we excite that fluorophore at a particular wavelength, right? And then inside the fluorophore, there's an electron. And probably much like yourselves right now, after you had a little bit of food, you become excited and you can't contain your excitement anymore. And then you decay and it emits light at an upshifted wavelength, right? No, that's how it works in a microscope. That's not how it works in an ibis. In the ibis, we shine the excitation light in, and if the excitation light is blue, guess what? It's completely attenuated by the blood. If it's green, it's completely attenuated by the blood. Huh. So I have to redesign this experiment right now, and I have to choose a fluorophore that excites and emits red. And there's not a lot of proteins out there that do that. Katushka 2S. 
That's the one that like is kind of in that range. RFP is not. RFP uses green excitation line, right? So it, yeah, you can see the emission coming out, but not coming in. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to shave the black mouse. And we're going to drive that excitation line in, and still 80% of it's going to get attenuated. So now you have to veet or nair or depilatory cream the mouse, right? And then you wait approximately five days, and the inflammation will go down. And we drive the excitation line in. And then it hits the skin, and it produces autofluorescence. All right. And then it goes in past the skin into the blood. And if this is not red, it's attenuated. And then it hits myoglobin. And if this is not red, it's attenuated. And eventually, one out of every one million photons that we put in hits the floor floor. The electron becomes excited, it decays, and it emits light at an upshifted wavelength. But it takes that same path of most resistance coming out. It hits the blood, red filter. It hits myoglobin, red filter. It hits the skin, autofluorescence. Oh, and this one came out to the side, but our camera's on top. So now we have to start all over again, right? So overall, just, I'm not even talking about the machine, just from a study design, just from physics and biology, when you're dealing with fluorescence inside of a mouse, it's a much noisier process. There's a lot more autofluorescence. Your choice of probes is more limited. And so there's a lot of reasons why I really recommend bioluminescence. And there's a lot of reasons why for oncology studies, everybody's doing bioluminescence and no one's doing fluorescence, right? So, but, yes. Then the excitation wavelength should be also around red, red. Yeah. All right. So that's why, like, I'm like, oh, RFP. RFP uses green excitation line, right? So it's not really that good. Yeah. Katushka 2S. Yeah. Alexa Floor 680. Alexa Floor 750. Psi 5.5, Psi 7, into cyanide and green. Those are all good. But are we coming on proteins on only the Katushka 2S? Katushka 2S, TD Tomato uses uh -huh. green excitation light, M Cherry uses green excitation light, RFP uses green excitation light. So there's a bunch, but if they're deep down inside the mouse or they're in a rat, because the excitation light is green, you can't really penetrate to that depth. Let me show you more. So, GFP is terrible. It uses blue excitation light, it has green emission light, it doesn't come out. This is DS red. This is also where cherry, tomato, plum, and RFP are, which happens to overlap with these two peaks in attenuation. So when you shine that green light right here, it doesn't go through. Psi 5.5, into cyanide green. Psi 7, Alexa Floor 750, Alexa Floor 680. These are good, but they're all dyes and chromes. There's no proteins except for that Katushka, which is right here. Yeah. All right. Let's get worse. So here's our fluorescence system. In the back there's a 150 watt tungsten halogen light source. The light from that, it's white light, comes up and we filter it in an excitation filter wheel. There's 10 filters in there where we specify what wavelengths or what bands we're going for. Then the light comes down, it's shined on the entire stage, or it's concentrated up through the middle in one pinpoint spot. Then we excite whatever's on the stage, the emission light comes up, there's an emission filter wheel with 18 filters in there, and then it reaches our camera. Okay? I'll go into this a little bit more. These are the excitation filters. We give you the capability to target any probe you want, but you're only a little bit into my talk, and you kind of already know that when you're choosing a reporter, you want to try to choose one that's here. Right? Don't worry. And these are your emission filters. You can work with just about any probe you want, right? We can see GFP if it's on the skin, right? We can see GFP, for example, uh, there's a scientist, he was doing an experiment where the gene that he was studying was present in the, the male and not present in the female. And he could look at the belly of the mom and see the pups inside the belly and see whether or not 
They saw it because the entire pup was expressing GFP, right? So he can count the number of pups inside and see what one of those pups is expressing GFP. Because this is gigantic. It's a whole pup inside of the mom, yeah. right? That's different than a, a tumor micromet in the lung, right? It's different than a little met in the brain. It's completely different, mm -hmm. right? These are big, big, big things, which we can see in here. But I don't know if you guys are seeing tumors as big as a pup. Hopefully not. No. First. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> maybe it sounds like a subcutaneous tumor model. Yeah, so you can see sub-Q. You can see sub-Q. You can excite sub-Q blue. You can see sub-Q green. That's fine. Your tumor is not going to stay sub-Q. It's going to metastasize. Your tumor, it's not going to be a sphere on the skin. It's going to grow like a pencil deep. And your stuff's not going to correspond. So if you can plan now for the future, I'm just trying to save you time. I'll teach you how all this stuff works. And I'm giving you my recommendation for what will be successful. And what will be successful is a nude mouse with bioluminescence. I'll teach you how to do GFP in a black mouse, but you're not going to be happy, right? And I'd rather you hate me now than invest all this time and all this money into your future and then two years from now not be able to publish and not have the stuff that you're looking at actually be visible and not have any of your experiments work. I'd rather you chew me out right now and be like, Will, you're an asshole. I don't like anything you have to say now. Because in the future, if we can just get over this fight, we're going to get along really well. Okay? <laughs> All right. In order to take a fluorescent image, you're going to check the box for fluorescence. You have the option when you excite whatever's on the stage. You can excite five mice across and shine the excitation light from above. Or you can put one mouse in the middle of the stage and shine light under that mouse, which is called transillumination. You choose an excitation and you choose an emission filter or you allow the imaging wizard to select multiple filters for you and then we can acquire our image. When we shine in the light from above, there's an excitation light pattern. We only have four mirrors. We have lenses, we have optics, we have some barrel distortion and some vignetting. You can look at this image and see that there's more excitation light in the center of the field of view than off of the edge. I have a black well plate over here. Every single well of this well plate contains the same number of cells. If I look at it in these uncalibrated units of counts, it appeared that the wells in the center have more cells than the wells off of the edges. If I switch the units to radiant efficiency, it normalizes for this excitation light pattern. And I can see that indeed I did have the same number of cells in every single well of that well plate. The units of radiant efficiency are a mouthful. They're photons per second per square centimeter per straight over milliwatts per square centimeter. But what that actually means is, if you have five mice on the stage, you have the same signal normalized amongst the five mice. Okay. <sighs> Remember we can't drive blue light in, we can't drive green light in. These are negative, negative. How do you say? Sham, naive, control, control. So there's no GFP in this mouse, none. But I told the machine that this is a GFP mouse. <clears throat> and his tissue autofluoresces with a great deal of signal. Then I take the same mouse that has no protein. Well, he has his own protein but he has no exogenous proteins. And I said, okay, this is an RFP TD tomato M cherry DS red mouse. And you can see that his tissue auto fluoresces at that wavelength as well. Now I say, okay, this is CY 5.5, Psi 5.5. This is Alexa Floor 680, Alexa Floor 680. And now my tissue autofluorescence is markedly decreased. Now I say, this is Alexafluor 750, Alexafluor 750. This is indocyanine green, ICG. This is Psi 7. 
There's almost no tissue autofluorescence. So, you can't drive the blue light in, you can't see the green light come out, and mouse tissue has the same yield as the GFP. Did I convince you yet not to work with GFP? Sure enough. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we can subtract off for signal. So, lots of times what's there is not just our tissue autofluorescence, but there's other things. So, my veterinarian, in order to keep my mice happy at the University of Costa Rica, what has to be in their cage? They have to have bedding underneath. What else? Enrichment. Enrichment. What's enrichment? Uh, it could be paper or cotton. Paper or cotton or like a and toy, the, the a little tube. tube of toilet paper, right? These guys will eat it. They're playing with it. How about the bedding they're on? They're eating the bedding? But they can't eat bedding and enrichment. They also need to eat food, right? So we give them food, and then we need a lot of protein in their food, so their food has a chlorophyll or alfalfa, yes. right? And they need water, right? Okay, so they're running around the cage in little mouse paradise, they're eating the bedding, they're eating the enrichment, they're eating the food, they're eating all of this. They're actually eating their neighbor's poop, <laughs> right? And in their belly, we're seeing that. We're seeing the signal from what they're eating. So, if you're gonna do a bioluminescence experiment, you have your cell line, you inject, you image, and you publish. If you're doing a fluorescence experiment, you have to select a bedding that doesn't have autofluorescence at the same channel as your fluorophore. You have to select an enrichment that doesn't have fluorescence at the same channel as your fluorophore. You have to select food that doesn't have fluorescence at the same channel as your fluorophore. You have to select a liquid or a water, right? Because sometimes you give them chemotherapy drugs, right? That doesn't have the same autofluorescence as your probe, right? So what I do is I take a handful of bedding and I take a handful of enrichment and I take a handful of food and I take a handful of the liquid and I put it all on the stage and I image it. Just like we did here, right? And I image it. And I say, okay, here on the stage, I have GFP. It's not really GFP. I just say, hey, GFP. And I see, what's it look like? Because if it has a strong signal, it's going to appear in the stomach of that mouse. So when we look at this mouse, and we're like, oh, it's the liver. No, it's not the liver. It's his animal diet. So this is the part number for an alfalfa-free rodent diet from Research Diets. But before you order that, just take some of your diet and put it on the shelf and image it and see if it has a strong signal. Typically, the strongest signal is from alfalfa, which comes from chlorophyll. So if you really want to get rich, design a fluorescent reporter based on chlorophyll because it's very visible. Great signal. Okay. Questions? Question? Happy? Sorry. It's okay. I was looking at something. Yeah. Something near infrared fluorescent brain. Yeah. What's it called? I don't see the name here in the paper. I just, just saw it here on Google. Okay. But there are some new, small, near infrared fluorescent brain. There's a, there's a few. What's their quantum yield like? <laughs> I'll have to look at it. Okay. So. Is it Neptune? No. Okay. Go check it. Check it. So when we excite, we can excite from above. If we excite from above, we can cover five mice simultaneously, right? So if you have something like ICG or Alexa 4750 and it's big tumors on the mouse, you can label them, you can image five at a cross. Or if you have a big model, like a rat or a fish, you can put the whole fish down on the shelf and illuminate the entire fish. Right? Like a catfish, like a big fish. Right? But if you have one mouse and the mouse has a small molar quantity of fluorescent reporter, or it's deep inside the mouse and you want to see it, 
you can transilluminate. So we concentrate all 150 watts of the excitation light underneath the mouse. And this is effectively brighter than a laser. And because it's brighter than a laser, we see a smaller molar quantity of our dye, which is really good. The other thing is, typically when we hit the skin, we produce autofluorescence. Well, now the mouse is sitting on top of his own autofluorescence. So the rest of his meat, the rest of his body is quenching that signal. So we're actually allowing the oxyhemoglobin to help us and to filter out some of the autofluorescence. So that when we shine from above, we have a lot less signal and a lot less background and more from our probe. So it's very advantageous. Cool. Okay. We also have the ability to normalize. So when we take a fluorescent image, you just check a little box that says normalize. Uh, when you check the little box that says normalize, it will first take a sunglasses filter and move it underneath the mouse. So it's white light across the entire spectrum, but attenuated white light. Then it'll take the proper excitation and move it underneath the mouse. So when we shine the attenuated white light, it makes everything autofluorescent. So now we know our baseline autofluorescence is, and we just negate for that, and that becomes our zero. And then we shine the excitation light, and when we're all done, we see a much more three-dimensional looking shape when we work in these NTF, normalized transmission fluorescence units, versus when we just look with excitation. Here, I'm not compensating for the curvature of the back of the mouse. Remember, our mouse isn't flat. He has a curved back. So even though the probe is more in the middle, I see a greater concentration here because it only had to travel one centimeter to get to the skin of the mouse. It only had to travel one centimeter here to get to the skin of the mouse. But to travel here, up, it had to travel to further reduce your amount of tissue autofluorescence. So I highly recommend that you at least check this out when it comes to you looking at your images, because hopefully it saves you a little bit of time. Okay, these are advanced topics. When someone comes back to give you guys advanced training, what we like is that you've already been using the system so that you can ask them applied questions and not theoretical questions, right? And you can say, hey, I'm doing my two-dimensional imaging. Here's a problem I'm having. Why, right? What's happening? And they can look at that and go, oh, your tumor model is becoming necrotic. So the time that you thought you had a plateau, it's not a plateau, right? It's actually shifted. Or you can look at it and go, hey, I'm doing 3D. How do I do multispectral and mixing? How do I do multiple probes? How do I do this? When I come and you bring them in front of the bench and you're like, here's my transfection, here's my sorting, right? We can look at this and find a better reporter for your cell line. And it's not this theoretical stuff, it's really applied questions like, hey, I tried to do this and it didn't work, what do I change? So this is a whole 16 hour class and I'm gonna cover it in like two minutes and just show you some of the capabilities of the system you have. Okay, so the first thing I want you to know is that your system can take a two-dimensional image, a two-dimensional image, and a two-dimensional image, and convert it into a three-dimensional image. When we looked at this mouse in two dimensions, it looked like he only had one brain tumor. But we look at this in three dimensions, and we can see that he has two brain tumors, right? So we're revealing a lot more in depth, okay, which is really nice. Do you remember when I said that green light doesn't go through tissue? I lied. It doesn't go through deep tissue. But if I come right here, now you can see it on the skin. So when we do this, we actually take a fluorescent emission filter. But we're doing bioluminescent, okay? And we move a green filter in between the mouse and the camera. And we take a picture. And then we move a yellow filter. And then we move an orange and a red and a near infrared. Well, if this room were completely dark and I had this here, right? Maybe you might see some near infrared light coming out. And if I move it here, maybe you see some red light. And I move it here, and maybe you can actually start to see it yellow. And here, maybe green. 
So if I put a filter here and I look and I say, okay, it's green, it has to be shallow, right? Because otherwise it will be attenuated by the blood. Oh, if it's here, it can only be infrared. So it applies yeah. that logic. It's called yeah. the Green's theory yeah. to this, and it pulls out the voxels inside that it thinks where your source is located. Does this make sense? Yes. Okay. In order to do that, it's necessary that you know the exact kinetic curve and that you do it during a plateau. Because if you try to do it during a peak, and you're like, okay, I had this much green, I had this much yellow, I had this much orange, Oh, I have a lot more orange, I have this much red, I have this much near infrared. It's not gonna do the calculation correctly, and it's gonna be like, yeah, I think it's shaped like a pencil, right? Even though it's not. Yes, sir. Is it validated against another systems like X-ray or something? CT. Like yeah. So we basically are watching something that is pretty much the real thing. I'm not gonna take your bait because yes. That is a slippery, slippery, slippery slope. Um, I'm gonna say it's its own thing, and there's a lot of publications that are out there that are completely open for debate, and you can go as deep in the water as you want to on this one. At the end of the day, this is molecular imaging, right? Yeah. So at the end of the day, there's a lot of inherent difficulty. If we take the mouse, and we spin the mouse, it's a lot more accurate than a mouse sitting on the stage without motion, right? A lot more accurate, right? So we can do a lot of reconstructions and we can, you can have hours of argument about the algorithm, I'm not gonna fall for it, right? You're right, it's not perfect, right? The best we can get is like within a millimeter, that's the best, right? Typically it's a few voxels, right? It's a few more than that, so let's just say everything's plus or minus about three millimeters, okay? It's not perfect. What it is, quick, dirty, and easy, and I can take her, she's never used this system before, and she'll be doing 3D in 15 minutes, right? She can't have a physics argument about what's going on optically, but she can look at this mouse, and when she freezes this mouse and does her sections, she'll know that instead of looking for one brain tumor, she has to take multiple slices here and look for a second brain tumor when she does her histopath to validate what's there. Does that, that's more clear, right? Yes. So this is not the end all be all, but this is an intact alive mouse with an alive tumor and we can see that there's actually a lot more happening here than we first thought. Awesome. Cool. Okay. But yeah, that's definitely one of the downsides. It's not perfect science, right? It's not. Okay. We can also do something called spectral unmixing. Here in the mammary fat pads, I've implanted some tumor cells that are labeled with ProSense 680, right? That's a black and white camera, and I pseudo colored them yellow so that our human eyes can see what's there. I've labeled my metal proteinases in the liver with MMP Sense 750 and pseudocolored that red. I've labeled my animal diet blue, because it's kind of cool, and you can see the animal diet right here, to further illustrate the point that animal diet will have significant signal. And then, depending if I'm doing this on a projector, normally it doesn't show up if I make the tissue white, so I make the tissue green. So if you ever go to a conference, and they ask you, hey, do you, what color what, what do you want? Do you want a poster? Do you want a projector? Whatever. Sometimes when you have the images of your mice, don't make the tissue white. It doesn't pop, right? If you make it like green, you got a pseudo color. And then if you look down here in the bladder, you can see an accumulation of the yellow and the red together. And you see it's kind of orange as the yellow and the red clear out and start to accumulate down here in the bladder. So you can do multicolored fluorescent imaging. That being said, ProSent 680 was the one that was right here. It's the red, and Pro, uh, MMP Sense 750 is near infrared, right? I don't have any GFP stuff there. Still good? Okay. Ah, it's my buddy Brian. Brian 
he used to work at MD Anderson with me, right? So, about 15 years ago, Brian wanted to do this study where he could see murine T cells trafficking to a tumor. And he wasn't having any luck. So he codon optimized a firefly luciferase and made it very bright, right? But then he wanted to sort for these cells and he didn't have a way to sort for them using bioluminescence. So this is 15 years ago. So he used a linker at the time, 15 years ago, he used IRES, IRES linker to EGFP. Nowadays, I would do a 2A linker, right? I would do A2A. And nowadays, I wouldn't use GFP, I would use Katushka 2S, right? So he then sorted, and he sorted all his cells, and so he only had the bioluminescent cells that were alive. And then we mixed some cells with some substrate, and we did a sub-Q injection. Here we have three cells. This is not three times 10 to the seven, this is one, two, three. Three cells, 10 cells, 30 cells. This is one minute of exposure time. Now I know it's subcutaneous, right? But this is what you can do with bioluminescence. With fluorescence, this is probably maybe 300,000, right? This is probably a million, three million, right? It's much more challenging to see what's there. So this is not to give you false hope. This is to encourage you to do your homework, plan, and anything that anybody's ever coming to you with in the microscope, and they're like, hey man, I got these GFP cell lines. I normally appeal to their ego. And I'm like, you were smart enough to get GFP on your cell line, and they're never gonna admit that somebody is getting a cell line, right? Oh, you were so smart, you got GFP on your cell line, right? Yeah, great. So put GFP plus bioluminescence on your cell line. You can do it. And do it now, because if that cell line is the one that you want to put into a mouse next year, let's get it glowing now. Let's make it so that in the future, you can go into a mouse, and then into a rat, and then into a monkey, and then into a dog, and then into a baby, right? And we can just keep going. If it works, it works. So plan now for the future, please. And anything I can do to help you guys, any publication you're looking for, any cell line, or if there's a collaborator in the States that you're like, this guy has a cell line that I want to work with, let me know and I'll give him a call. Okay, just to summarize, light is going to scatter inside your mouse, so position your mouse dorsal or ventral so that you can see what's there. We use these calibrated physical units, and so anytime you're doing your analysis, you should work in the radiance or the photons or the radiant efficiency and not those counts, okay? We have a custom designed system, it has integrated gas anesthesia, it's ready to go, you keep your mice intact, and you can see what's there, right? Your instrument settings are analogous to manual photography. Remember, we go outside, but it's nice, bright, and sunny, quick picture. You got a big tumor, quick picture. We go outside at night, long exposure, tiny little micromet, long exposure. Use the software for both acquisition and analysis. Images are required in a multi-step process. You can increase your sensitivity by going to a longer exposure time, a more open aperture or larger binning. And when you're doing your fluorescent imaging, you can excite from above to get five points across, or you can excite from below using transmission to get pinpoint out of one mouse. And then we can subtract off for tissue autofluorescence. There's a very nice manual that comes from the system. I don't mean this in a pejorative way. I don't mean this in a bad way. Our typical user, even in the US, is not a native English speaker. Plenty of people come from all over the world and they're using this technology. They don't speak English as their first language. The manual is written assuming that you don't speak English as your first language. Go to the manual. It has step by step by step instructions. We don't assume that you're an electrical engineer or a physicist. We assume you're a biologist. So ask it. What's this deradian? Why do I want to subtract this stuff out? What? I don't understand this exposure time. I don't believe it. Ask it, right? It'll explain it to you in step-by-step -step instructions. And if you see a word that doesn't make sense because it's a physics word, not an English word, just ask it and it'll define the word. 
There's also a nice uh, university where you can watch some videos, and I'll send you some links after this to some videos. We have a full line of reagents. If you send an email to in vivo reagents, they can send you a whole catalog. We have substrates. We have this d luciferin substrate for Firefly. We have the cilentrazine substrate for the Galaxy and the Renella. We have pre-prepared stuff, but you don't want that. You want the cell. It's way cheaper. Um, we have cell lines. We have a full line of probes that are mostly at 680 and 750 because uh, that's what's going to work. And then if you need to get a hold of technical support, that is the email address for our global technical support. That's my email and that's my WhatsApp. I'll put a link to that on the desktop of the computer and I'll stick a card on the side of the computer too. So if you guys need to bug me, you can bug me. Sure. Questions? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Bill, for everything. My pleasure. We really appreciate it. And I wanted to ask you just a couple of last questions. Do you also sell cell lines or very express in some of these proteins like Katushka? Yeah, uh, Katushka is a little different. So Katushka, there's a publication from like Dmitry Sherbo. I've never met this guy. He's out of like Ukraine or out of Russia. And it was a nature publication where he had Katushka and he had a different publication where he has Katushka 2S. And he lists the base pairs. And the base pairs are very elegant. And then there's a commercial company called Evrigen. And Evrigen sells the Katushka construct for 600 euros. And there's many more base pairs than in the Nature publication. So if I were you, I would go on AdGene or I would go on Nature and I would find the base pairs for Katushka 2S or I would just obtain some Katushka 2S as an academic okay. or synthesize it myself at 50 cents a base pair and I would make it like this as opposed to buying it from Evergen. All right. Yeah. There's another one I want to just found it. The name is MI RFP 670 Nano. Cool. You just post here. Okay. Try it. Or send the guys a nice. Um, I was saying to you. Yeah. Um, uh, these guys are probably not going in vivo. So these guys are in a microscope. Yes. Yeah, they discussed that they could be used in vivo. <laughs> it could be used in vivo. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, you might end up being the first guy to ever use it. Um, and I don't really like to be the first guy to ever <laughs> use something. Um, but that being said, I mean, the worst that will happen is you send them an email and you're like, hey guys, want to go on vacation in Costa Rica and bring me some of your plasma? Um, and they come here and you try it and it works or it doesn't work. All right. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Anybody else? No questions? No questions. Uh, yeah, there is, uh, do you have experience with CTCs, um, experiments with that technology? Yeah, but in vivo, not the, the I have a colleague uh -huh. who worked with the guys at Harvard, Mass Gen. Massachusetts General Hospital uh -huh. or Harvard? This is the one you're talking about? Um, I have a colleague that worked with them. Okay. Um, so I've only done CTCs in vivo, but he worked with the ones where they have that system okay. that does the, um, it did the, the, that little microcapillary tubing. Uh -huh. That one, and they had the laser, and they were measuring it. Uh -huh. I have a, my colleague did this, oh. but not me. I can put you into contact with him. Send me a message, or send me an email, or send me a WhatsApp, or send me something, um, and uh, I'll hook you guys up, and he can introduce you to the investigator who did that. Okay. But my, my experience is simply in vivo, uh -huh. and so for all, you need a longer exposure. They're not concentrated in any one spot, is and basically, I'm drawing that big rectangular ROI across the entire subject and basically measuring like an overall burden over time. Okay. And then we can see when they finally uh, stop circulating, 
or they get stuck in the spleen or the lungs or the liver. Yeah, then it's, it's, it's for for the dissemination of the of the cell. I am I'm more interested in that part. Yeah, you're more interested when they're in the blood than in the when they vascularize. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm not an expert in that, but I have a colleague who knows it a little bit better than I do. Yeah. When you were talking about the uses of uh, this machine, uh, you told that you can see things about inflammation. Yeah. Did you hear about something about because I work with pain? Always work with analgesic, anesthesia, things like that. And I don't know if I can apply something related to inflammation because I work with pain. So pain comes, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, inflammation comes pain. So Sometimes. I don't know if you hear about some. So we have some dyes that will traffic to inflammation, such as like angiosense will traffic to inflammation. So if you, for example, inject some of this dye in your tail vein, and then you wait 17 hours, it um, will accumulate in the areas where there's inflammation. We have more specific stuff that will, uh, it's fluorescent probe that doesn't fluoresce, but then it will cleave in the presence of certain promoters. I don't know which ones. And when it does that, you'll have fluorescence expression. So you can do that and see like those types of um, areas. Um, if you send an email to that and tell them what you want and be like, hey, what do you got for inflammation markers? They will send you a catalog because it's just a salesperson at first and then just reply and be like, no, I don't want just a catalog. Here's what I want to measure, right? And then they'll put you in contact with a chemist or a scientist or a vet, and then you can be like, hey, here's what I want to quantify. And then they'll actually say, okay, here's this one study. Here's the inflammation that correlates to some type of pain, right? And then you can probably try to correlate, but I'm not sure if you'll get more than correlation out of it. Yes, sorry. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to move over to the IVIS. I have a little plastic phantom mouse. We can take pictures of that. Um, depending on how many of you want to play with either a real mouse, play with a phantom. If some of you guys have an appointment or a meeting, we can do multiple groups. Um, I like to do groups of like three to five people. And that way everybody has a chance to like um, speak up, not be embarrassed, touch the machine if you want to touch the machine. And we can do this a couple of times if you want to do it. Um, do you know what our schedule is? I'm yours all day today. We can work until midnight if you want. So whatever you want to do. Yeah, the first group were... I think after lunch. And we will last maybe one hour per group, right? Uh, approximately, except for the one where we have to anesthetize the real mice. I think no, not real mice. When we anesthetize the real mice, I think this is going to take a little bit longer. Because they don't have fluorescence or bioluminescence, so we don't see anything. Yeah. Just to bring the mice and try the, the anesthesia, it doesn't make so much sense. No? You already know that. No, no, no. No, no, no. no. Mouse, but We're, I mean, but we've, never, we've never actually validated it. We've never knocked out a mouse before. So, like, before I leave,
You want to? Okay, let's say, let me give you an example. If you leave, and then tomorrow he comes in and he goes to anesthetize a mouse and it doesn't work, what are you going to do? You'd be like, whoa, I thought it worked. But he can go get a mouse. You want to return the machine. You can, yeah. exactly, right? So he has 30 days to like test it. Why not test it now? Yeah. And then when he's all done, we can turn it off or you know, he can use it in January so or whatever. Want the mouse. Absolutely. We want him we want to use the mouse. We want to pull it slip. Yeah. Because this way he knows it. we have our vet. Right? You here. gotta stay heal Kilma? 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 Tu estás acá en primer grupo en segundo. Porque yo le I asked Javier not to bring the mice. Because he only can bring two. That's fine. <coughs> I just want to take one and make it go to sleep, and this way we know. But I can show you with my plastic mouse. But it's not the same. So we take one of your students, and we have them breathe the isoflurane. <laughs> <laughs> and when <Which> she... <laughs> and then we're going to do, do some <laughs> minor <laughs> surgery on you. Just minor. <laughs> <laughs> it's for science. It's for no, science. No, no. We're joking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, whatever you want to do. But normally I do this at the training time. I want to see it. I, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it's easy for you to minimize? Um, or is it difficult? Uh, now not anymore. Because okay. I, I have to inject someone like, yeah, around, it's okay. like around one. So I, I wouldn't be able to make it like, to go it's and okay. come back. And, it's okay. Yeah. So we'll play with my plastic mouse. Um, and then, do you have the isoflurano? Yeah. Okay, cool. things first when we come here we want to make sure that we're able to use the system in order to use the system we need mice and in order to get mice going we need the anesthesia system to work so I'm going to start with the anesthesia system so the anesthesia system uses oxygen as a carrier gas now there's a regulator up there and the regulator is preset to 50 psi great job so the oxygen is going to come down this tube and it's going to come first to this master switch so if we turn this master switch on then we're going to have oxygen, and the oxygen is going to get delivered to a vaporizer. At the vaporizer, it's going to pick up isoflurane, and then it's going to deliver isoflurane to here. This is called an induction chamber, and then it's also going to deliver isoflurane inside the instrument 
to the ibis. Now at the ibis, there's a spot where we can connect a manifold. Here you guys have a manifold. This manifold has positions for five mice across. It has these removable glass nose cones, so we can take these things out and clean them if we want to. There's five additional glass nose cones right here in this box, and there's little dividers. Remember how I said we want to use black well plates? There's little dividers that we can insert into here to help us segregate the light between one subject and another subject. The gas comes down these nose cones, and then it gets vacuumed out. Now, isofluorite is a little bit heavier than air. It's 1.5 times what air weighs. So it's actually going to drift down, and then these are the vacuums, and it's going to get educted out. It's going to get educted if we have this vacuum pump running. When we have the vacuum pump running, it's going to be pulling on this tube right here at a flow of 10 liters per minute. It's going to be pulling on the IVIS at a flow of 5 liters per minute. And there's one additional vacuum. It's way down in the bottom up here. There's a pipe that has some perforations in it. And I just have this set to a very minimal amount, just a little bit less than atmosphere, so that in case any isofluorine were to be in here, it would roll off, go down to the bottom, and then be inducted out. When it's inducted out, or when it's vacuumed out, it's then sent to this. <coughs> this is a charcoal canister. So this is refillable carbon. It has a weight, and when the weight increases by 100 grams, we're going to dump the charcoal out, you take the lid off, you dump the charcoal out, you refill it with activated carbon, and you do it. When I dump this thing out, I put it into a bag, then I close the bag up, and I, I put it outside by the dumpster, or I'll put it inside of a hood, and make sure the hood vents to the outside, right? There's some precautions that you have to take with isofluorine. First and foremost, you want to weigh this. This is your protection. So at the beginning of every day, before you turn anything else on, you want to weigh this. And if it's more than 100 grams increase, there's a spare one right here that you can use in the interim. Okay? So that's your first protection. Yeah. The second is to be aware of isofluorine. Isofluorine is heavier than air. So if you smell it, you're smelling it up here. <laughs> right? So if you smell it up here, you're about seven parts per million. Right? And at seven parts per million, you'll develop a headache. You might want to fight. <laughs> or you might be tired. Right? So if you want to punch somebody, I want to punch somebody. You always want to punch somebody. <laughs> right? So, except for this guy, he always wants to punch somebody. Right? But if you want to punch somebody, or if you're tired, or you have a headache, or sometimes. I'll go into Vivaria, and there's like one room, and I walk in the room, and I'm, and I'm like, fuck, ah, right? And they have like an old, not ours, but like an old anesthesia system like in the corner, and there's not a lot of ventilation in the room, or the ventilation in the room is very badly designed, and the supply is over here, and like it blows it right past your nose, and like the vacuum is over here, right? Where the supply is on the floor, and it's like lifting the isofluorine up past your nose and like out the ceiling. It's backwards ventilation. And so sometimes I'll just go into rooms and I'm like, nope, I'm out, right? And I just shut the door and I'm like, hey, I can't go in this room. It hurts me. I'm only gonna say this to you. If you might be pregnant, <laughs> right? In the US, you don't have to tell anybody you're pregnant, right? You don't have to let anybody know. So it's between you and yourself. But if you're exposing a fetus to isofluorine, its liver isn't fully developed to clear that out, right? So it's especially toxic. So if you're pregnant, you have to follow some precautions. And some precautions are weighing this, and if you want an additional measure of protection, you're gonna have to shave, okay? Because you're gonna get fitted for an anybody have questions. If you come into this room and you have a headache, check this, right? If you come into this room and you smell isofluorine, shut the door and leave. Don't stay in here and try to figure out what's going on. Just leave. It's not worth it. Because if you're at seven parts per million here, down there you're at 150 parts per million and you'll be dead. Yes.
someone does is like 18 months, nice. right? What? <laughs> you know what I told you? And someone would ask? Someone's going to ask. We yeah. got an for Okay, that. so this is an isoflurane bottle. An isoflurane bottle has a collar. See the collar? And on the collar, there's a little ear and a big ear. This is an isoflurane filler, and it corresponds. You see there's a spot for a little ear and a spot for a big ear, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove this cap, and I'm going to put this on, okay? And you might smell a little bit of isoflurane. And then, and then I'm putting this on the wrong way. Now I'm just going to spin this entire thing. So now this is a de facto cap. Right? And if I open this, now the cap is open. And if I close this, now it's effectively kept up. And then you do whatever you want with that, okay? I definitely would not smell that if I were you. I would not smell that. I would definitely not smell that. <laughs> okay. You get it? Anybody else? I smell a lot. Yeah. <laughs> No, 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 no. Yeah, it's like vanillic, I think. It's like a phenol similar. Okay. So it's glass. Okay. 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 Just two fingers, and I'm going to pull this thing out. Now this is a special key, and it will only fit an isoflurane vaporizer. And this is a special key, and it will only go inside of an isoflurane vaporizer. So if someone has a bottle of anesthetic, and the collar is red or yellow, it's not going to work in here. You'll be delivering an inappropriate amount of that halogenated um, anesthetic to the system, or it could be very dangerous. So you don't want to do it, right? Really so, halothane, yeah, halothane. Yeah, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open the lid, right? And then the liquid is going to come down here, and it's going to come out this big hole. And down in the bottom of this, there's a big hole. And then the gas that it displaces out of here it's going to come back and refill the bottle so I don't have to breathe any of the isoflurane vapor. Does that make sense? So all I'm going to do is I'm just going to insert this into here. And once it's fully seated, you can get closer if you want. I'm going to tighten that, right? So now it's tight. This is tight. And now all I'm going to do is I'm just going to turn this. And now my liquid is going down that straw and it's starting to fill this up. And once this is all the way filled, and there's nothing leaking here, I'm going to remove this and cap it. I'm going to take this, the flat surface right here, mates up on the bottom, and it can only go in one way. And I'm going to tighten this, just two fingers on my left hand. So you're probably going to be using the system the most, maybe. Do you want to fill this up for me? We can use this machine uh, without the ice. You can? Yeah. That's for draining it. You don't want to mess with that. If you if you put this thing in upside down, down there in that bottom, mm -hmm. and you open this, it will drain any liquid that's in here back into the bottle. So I'll take this entire unit and I'll move it here and then I'll put this in upside down, and I'll drain it out, and then if this, you have to ship it away to a different city for calibration, right. you can do that. But normally, yeah. it's never a problem. And how do you adapt the mask here outside? I don't understand the question. Because I want time. to use this, ma this machine for anesthesia for surgery. Okay. So, cool. I if, if I... I see. And then I have to tighten that there, and then it makes it seal up. If you notice there's leaking here, then the holes aren't lined up. And you don't have to like, you don't have to crank on it. 
And then I just turn it, and then I watch here. So, the first time, I think the vaporizer will take 200 milliliters. I think you have a 100 milliliter bottle. Each successive time, each next time, it'll only drink about 100 milliliters. So, I would expect to put the entire bottle in. Okay, now it's all the school with you, right? You're perfect, good. <coughs> Is your bottle empty? Almost. Almost. Yeah. You could probably just throw the rest. Just okay. Yeah. So when I'm all done, I literally just leave it like that, capped off, and ready. Um, I, are, am I permitted to leave a bottle of isoflurane out in a room? Or is it a medical drug that you need a prescription for here? Okay, so does it have to be kept under lock and key? Does that door count as a lock and key? Okay, so this cabinet that has a lock and key on it, it will work. So when we're all done, we're going to take our bottle, and these will come in a case of like 30 bottles or 20 bottles, and we're just going to put it inside our cabinet, and then we're not violating anything. And whatever it remains in here, so it'll, it'll stay in here for months or years. It doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't go bad. Nothing happens. Uh, everybody told me that. So uh, yeah, I don't. I don't normally, I don't typically do that, um, but if you want to, you can. So yeah, so when we're all done, we're gonna put it in here, um, and that'll be that. Okay, so. Would you mean keeping this thing? Or this is just a tool. So I remove that and put the cap. I don't remove it. You leave this? Yeah. Yep. So you come in, you just add a little, and so now it's half full, quarter full, and then I put the rest in here. Up oh, for the new one. For the new one. Yeah. Yeah. For this old one, so I'm, just I'm not going to do it because as soon as I take this off, it's going to start evaporating and all this other stuff, and I don't want to breathe that. So I just leave it for the next. So for the next bottle, then we need to. Then I just take it off and do it. Yeah. Okay. So first things first is that I'm going to come over here and I'm going to open up my oxygen bottle. You want to make sure that your oxygen bottle is secured. If this oxygen bottle tips over, it's very dangerous, right? So we want to chain it to a table or chain it to the floor, right? And now we only have two switches. First switch is our oxygen. Now our oxygen is coming in. Our oxygen is going to the induction chamber, and our oxygen is going to the ibis. And the next thing we want to check is our vacuum, right? Our vacuum is sucking from the induction chamber. It's sucking from the ibis. Now we're ready to go. Just two switches, okay? Oxygen is being supplied to the induction chamber at one liter a minute, right? And it's being vacuumed here at 10 liters a minute. So it's a nice 10 to 1 exchange ratio. Oxygen is being supplied to the IVIS at 500 cc's a minute, and it's being sucked out right here at 5 liters a minute. So it's a 10 to 1 exchange ratio. You should never smell isoflurane with this system. If you smell isoflurane, there's a problem. I don't know what the problem is but there's a problem, right? So somewhere, something is disconnected. I don't know what it is. Turn off the oxygen. This is the mechanical energy that's delivering the isoflurane everywhere. If that, so if you close this and then just go get some coffee and come back an hour later and put a sign on the door. Don't come in, don't clean the room, don't mess with it. Little white switch right here, this unlocks this. And I'm gonna start off at 2.5% isofluorine. It's okay, come, come. 2.5% and I want you to do this. So you're gonna push here and you're gonna start off at 2.5%. You see that line right there? 
that corresponds to two and a half percent. And now we're going to take our mouse and we're going to put our mouse inside here. So at two and a half percent, the isoflurane is coming in this tube. And remember, it weighs more than air, right? So think of it like a liquid. It's filling up like water, right? It's filling up, and it comes to here in the back first. Well, you see right here, this is where the opening is. So, and here's where the vacuum is. So if it's filling it up, and then it reaches the capacity, it's spilling out the back, and it's getting vacuumed out. And there's a little lid on the front. So again, we shouldn't be smelling any isoflurane. So I'm going to take probably five mice from my first cage, and I'm going to put five mice inside the induction chamber, and I'm going to knock them all out. And then, in about two and a half minutes, they're all going to be asleep. You have to test. So when the subject is no longer responsive to external stimulus, wake up, wake up, wake up, he's asleep, right? <laughs> Then we can take the mouse out, and we have approximately 30 seconds. The mouse will be under anesthesia to do an injection, to shave it, to nair it, to prep it, to put it into a restraining device, or to put it inside the ibis. After about 30 seconds, it's going to wake right up. So the advantage to isoflurane is it clears very rapidly, it leaves no trace, and the mouse, once you reduce this to 0%, He's now 100% oxygen. In 30 seconds, he'll be wide awake. Okay? Now we want to move the mouse over inside the ibis. If we open up the door to the ibis, open the door. You'll see there's a spot on the door, on the floor, in the corner, where there's a lure lock and a lure lock, right? And one is male and one is female. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Take a look. It's in the far back corner, there's two lures, like on the end of a syringe. And this is our anesthesia manifold. And you see one is male and one is female. So one should correspond to gas, and one should correspond to vacuum. So one more reason why we really like to test live mice is when I make a mistake. I make mistakes all the time. When I'm plumbing the tubing, if I switch vacuum and exhaust, when they put the mouse here, the mouse will get sucked like right in, <laughs> or they'll call me and be like, nothing's happening. I turn this up to 5%, the mouse is not asleep, right? I'm like, I screwed up. I switch the supply and the vacuum, and they're backwards. Switch them back and see what happens, right? There's one more thing. Sometimes people will turn this off. I don't know why, but they'll turn this off. You don't have to turn this off. You don't have to turn this off. So this stays on all the time, and this stays on all the time. If you want to cut off the gas, Cut off the gas right here. Now there's nothing. There's no more oxygen, there's no more isofluorine, there's no more oxygen, there's no more isofluorine. Right? But sometimes someone looks in the stage underneath. That's okay. <laughs> we knew this was going to happen. This happens all the time. Don't panic. There's a button right here that says service. Will you say, uh, remind me, or close that for me? You want to click it? Close that. That's a different something. But click on service and say yes. This happens all the time. There's nothing to panic. You don't have to worry. We designed this machine for biologists. Nothing to worry about. When the light turns green, you're safe to open up the door. Our stages move up and out of the way. Our mouse is probably down here in the bottom. <laughs> we anticipated this. So much that in that box right there, there's a little miniature flashlight. Right? So you can shine it inside, you can go get your little black mouse on the bottom. Oh, black mice. You can get your little <laughs> black mouse down on the bottom, right? You can snag them. Please do this quickly. Yes. If you call me and it's Sunday, I'll answer the phone. I'll teach you where the button is. If you call me and it's Friday night, I'll answer the phone. Don't ever call me and be like, my machine smells bad. Your machine's made out of metal. It doesn't smell bad. There's mice inside the machine, and they're just dead, right? <laughs> you're cleaning that mess up yourself. You call me, you're like, hey, well, I lost the mouse. No problem. Relax. We'll figure it out. We'll get the mice, right? 
if you leave the mice in here for about 90 minutes, they get thirsty. If you leave the mice in here for four hours, they eat each other. If you leave the mice in here for about two hours, they go on the side and they crawl up this lead screw. There's a spindle screw and they go up in the top and they eat all the electronics and they shit and piss all over all the optics and then I get really mad at you. Like really <laughs> mad at you. And we have to rewire all this stuff up top. But it takes like four hours to get there. And usually there's a little like, the beta mouse is down here and he's dead and the alpha mouse is oh, he's up here at the top. Yeah, he dies eventually too. Okay. Questions. Does that ha happen to you? All the time. No, no, not that the mice go away. All the Does time. They leave the mice more of hours. Once and a month. That really? Once a month, I get a phone call. My machine smells bad. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> wow. We had a, a hamster that escaped and destroyed a car. Yep. Because he eats all the computers. All the electronics. Yep. They love the taste of insulation on the wires. Yep. So, just, it's okay, this happens, you run out of isofluorine, you run out of oxygen, you forget, someone comes in, they turn this knob, it's okay, call me, we'll talk it through, I will answer the phone, right, it's not a big deal. If you can't get a hold of me, there's a 1-800 number on my card, or send an email to Global. Okay, so now we need to make the stage to go back down, so we can put the manifold in, so we can anesthetize our mouse. That button you clicked before that said service, now it says load, right? You can come look. So this button right here, it normally said service, now it says load. When he clicks load, it's gonna move it back down here to the position where we load our mice. So go ahead and click that button, load. Do you think I wouldn't teach you this if I didn't get this question like all the time? <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. All right. What we call job security. All right. I would like for you, please, to attach this to the system. He's never used it before. He's okay. Right? So you want to move the manifold to the mouse. 
like that. You want to have the mat underneath, and you just want to put the mouse inside. Just like that. And if you have multiple mice, we're going to put the dividers, but we only have one mouse, so we don't need the divider. Okay? If you're doing field of view C, this is field of view C. If you're doing field of view D, you can make it field of view D. Will you make it field of view D for me? See, field of view, will you make that D like delta? And then when we open up the door, now we see there's a spot in here for two rads or five mice across. Will you make that field of view B like Bravo? Okay. Try field of view A like Alpha. It might give you a warning and just say okay. I don't know. There you go. Okay. So now at alpha, we're only doing the back, right? But we want to do the head. So we move the mouse first to his brain, and we pick up the manifold, and we move the manifold here. And remember, anytime you're working with a real mouse, you have to wear a mask. Probably you're wearing some um, gown, and probably you're wearing gloves, and maybe you're wearing booties on your shoes. Anytime. Yes? Okay. So this is going to prevent you from exposing yourself to mouse fur and mouse dander. Come on, see this is dander. You know the dead skin that makes you an allergy? So it's an accumulation over your lifetime. I'm sorry I have to leave this. Here I apologize. This is my fault. No, that's fine. So when normally with other allergens, when you're a baby, you crawl around on the floor you put the dirt in your mouth, then you're never allergic to this ever again. So if you had a dog when you were a baby and the dog licked your face, you're never gonna be allergic to dogs, right? But if you have a baby in a sterile environment and then you put the baby in front of a dog, the baby's like or the human has allergies, right? Because they weren't exposed to it as a baby, except for mice. Mice, the more you're exposed to mice, the more your body reacts to it. So, usually people who are in research who work with mice for a living eventually develop this. And then you can't do any more experiments. Which sucks, especially if you're on the breakthrough of curing a disease. So, wear your mask, wear your gloves, wear some hair bonnet, wear the gown, put the booties on, it's an extra five minutes, it's a pain in the ass, just, just do it, okay? Okay. I always do. <laughs> of course. We always do. We always, we always do it. All right. Hey, can you make that field of view C like Charlie? All right. So we have our manifold, we have our mouse, and we're ready to go. So now we're going to be using the software. So this is a plastic mouse, and so because it's a plastic mouse, I have everything now turned off, right? But normally you would keep this running the whole time. Does that make sense? But we don't need to waste it. There's no sense. Okay. We have our mouse who's inside, and now we want to take a picture of the mouse. So we need to use the software. Now, I was using the software before, right? But let's just pretend that you come here initially. And it looks like that, right? So the username is it the Ivis user, and the password is lowercase p-a-s-s-w-o-r-d, password, all lowercase, right? Whoever wants to drive the bus can drive the bus. Who's the bus driver? Yeah, go for it. All right. I'll be here the whole day. I think you're going to be here, <laughs> the expert, right? Okay. Password. It's not a capital P, it's a lowercase p. Okay, so I'm doing something wrong. That's a minor yeah. password. Oh, is the caps lock on? You can see where you are. You are in C. Okay, now should be fine. Good job. Mm -hmm. So that's the software. Yeah, I have a seat. There's also a link to the software right there. So in case the software is not open, it's there. Now, you've never used the system before. No. That's normal, right? Mm -hmm. So right here, there's a button to add a new user. Right. So click that. 
And then you want to type in your initials. Because you remember the metadata? Mm -hmm. Your metadata is going to stick with you. Okay. So you can give it a password or not. It's not like this is high security. No, I think it doesn't matter. I would say add. Okay. And then okay. Now you're logged in. If this light is green, you can begin your experiment. If this light is grayed out or red, you can't go. You, red is stop, green is go. So you can go. Same thing on the door. Green is go, you can go ahead and open up the door. Red, stop. There's a problem, I don't know. E-stop, if you hit the e-stop, it powers off the entire system. Okay? So you're ready to go. So we have a bioluminescent mouse who's inside of here, and we want to take an image. Do we want to take a one second image? Or there's that other function. Do you remember that other function? Remember I said, in case you forget, I want you to remember. Yeah, I'll money. <laughs> That'll work. Down, down. Perfect, auto. Everybody get that? So he clicked on auto, and now he's ready to go. So you're ready to go. Go ahead and say acquire. All right. Now it's gonna ask you, Javier, do you want to auto save? Yeah, I want to auto save, sure. There's two hard drives. There's a small C drive, and there's a big D data drive. So yes. And then click on the big D data drive. <coughs> click on make a new folder. And then type your name. OK, select that folder. And from now on, it's going to save everything in your folder. Great. The light is red, and there's an electromagnet that engages right here, so you can't. Well, you can't if you really want to, but you can't open the door. <laughs> you should. Cool. Okay. Remember, you want to fill that out. So today's experiment is training, and there's a comment right here. It says time point. Today's day one of our experiment. It doesn't yeah. simultaneously um, read out and allow you to change metadata, and then it allows you to edit it, and then it'll save it in a permanent folder. Great job. <laughs> All right, let's look at your image. So say OK. Um, let's look at your image, and we see in the right lung, right, we're about, what, 5,000 counts? And in the left lung, we're about, what, 4,500 counts? So if this were a lung met model, would we consider this to be good, bad, acceptable, unacceptable? Do you like it? Do you hate it? Tell me about it. It's not so specific, I think. I mean, it's a lot of counts all over the lungs, right? Yeah. So what do you think? This is very typical. This is molecular imaging. This is 2D molecular imaging. And that mouse has the same tissue properties as a real mouse. Okay. That's what you can expect. But don't you mean the 600 to 60,000 thing? So his max is in the 600 to 60,000 um, range. He's at four, he's at 5,000. Mm -hmm. So 5,000 is well above 600 and it's well below 60,000. He's good to go. That image that he's talking about, though, he he doesn't um, he's not in love with it, right? No. But that's very 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 typical of molecular imaging. So that's what you should expect to see. Yeah, and then what do you do? Save it, man. Save it. <laughs> so. There is a red X in the upper right hand corner of that image to close it. Just right. click that red X. Okay. And say, do you want to auto save? Yeah, I'll auto save. Okay. And then we come back tomorrow. Okay. We come back in a week, <coughs> and we see where our lung mats are at a week, in a week. But with that model that we just looked at, we can see everything that we wanted to see. You're seeing 3,000 cancer cells in the mouse's lung. Yeah, of course it's diffuse, it's whatever, right? Who cares? Bro, you just saw 3,000 cells in the lung of that mouse. Holy crap. 
like your tumors had to be so big before you had this that like you could see them from across the room. So yeah, it's diffuse. It's it's molecular imaging. It is what it is. It's not 3D. It's not fancy. It's not beautiful. But the level of detection that's there, it's awesome. Okay. It's fantastic. Okay? okay. So pretend we all get in a time machine and we fast forward and now it's tomorrow. It's day two of our experiment. You come in, you initialize, you anesthetize the mouse, and now we click acquire. It's day two. Change that comment from day one to day two. So these are preset, preset, preset out to the IVIS, number one, preset out to the induction chamber, number two, preset out number three. Output number three corresponds right here and it's variable. Output number four is right here and it's variable. So these are uh, like John Guest fittings, so you push it down on the collar, push the collar down, and you can pull this thing out. When you insert a tubing, you insert a tubing right here. There's additional tubing down here in this in this box there's additional pieces of tubing right javier what are our counts on day two you have an additional vacuum right here and the additional vacuum corresponds to this one which is vacuum done right so you can run that right there if i were doing surgery maybe i would pipe it to here no it's it to here I have some elbow, so you can do it. Or if you have a little surgery station, you can do it. What are our max counts, Javier? All right, we have like a little bit more like 3,000. You got it, which is or something. Which is above the threshold. Yeah, that's right. Above the threshold. Which is 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 effectively valved up, and I just adjust it right here. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Okay, I use this mask for this. Bye. Bye. Ciao. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. So you can use whatever you want. I would run tubing, and if you already have a nose cone, you can run it to a nose cone, and if you need vacuum, you can vacuum it out. Because we are going to make a six dent. So I have uh, these. I'll give them to you. Oh. So this will go on this type of tubing. And if you take a wrench, you can take this off. This is for a rat. So if you switch it between rat and mouse, you can do that. But what you can do is you can screw your gas and exhaust into here, into the tubing. And then you can do surgery here on one mouse or on two mouse. You can put a rubber stopper in this and just have the flow going to one mouse. And then you're not going to gas yourself while you're doing a surgery here if you like that. I would get a light and I'd get a little heat lamp. And um, these guys haven't done a lot of tail vein injections. So I would get some type of restraining device so that they're more comfortable um, doing it. You know what I'm talking about? It's like a. It's like a big syringe with a plunger, uh -huh. and it has a slot, and you pull the tail through the slot, uh -huh. and then you push the syringe close, and the mouse is in there. Uh, I have one. Okay. You know this? You have this? Yeah. So I think this is going to help them with their tail vein infection. So the vein Okay. So let's save that image. So say OK on the metadata. Ah, sorry, yeah, yeah. And then go ahead and click the red X. Okay. And now you're good to go. So now, pretend we're all in a time machine, and now it's Sunday, it's day three. Go ahead and click Acquire, and then we'll have three days worth of images. You're doing good. He's an expert. He's good. This is a real-time image. No. Correct. So it popped pop that photograph in the very beginning, and then it turns off the lights, and it opens up the shutter for a long period of time, and it's taking the bioluminescent. So yeah, at the end, you'll hear it go click, and then click, and that's the longer exposure. And if you don't see the animal in this moment, you cannot 
Uh, <clears throat> when he's doing it, there's a little button in the bottom that says abort, and the acquire button changes to stop. Nice. So he can do it. All right, our day three image. What's our max counts in that right lung? It's still like 3,000. Yeah, right. or you say okay here, yeah. and then click the red X and close it. Yes. Okay, now go to File, Browse, and go to the D drive, to the hobby folder, mm -hmm. and say okay. Each one of those folders is a file. Okay. And each one of those has between like four and 14 different components, depending on what's there, to make it a living image file. So just go to JM and say select the JM folder. And it, because it's a browse, will look inside. Ah, we didn't select the JM. Click on browse. Click on uh, JM. So one back. Yeah. Go to and that say select the folder. Now it will browse inside JM for the metadata. And you can see here, day one, day two, day three, right? And if you left click only once, right, on any one of those, just one click, then it gives you a little thumbnail. And if you drag down, click and drag, yep, now we have all three, and if we say load as a group on all three images, one, two, three. So now we have our day one and our day two and our day three, right? And I was moving the mouse around from day to day to day because Probably when you put your mice in, it's not going to be in the same location every single day. Yeah. Okay. So the first thing we want to do is you want to look at the image and go to the upper left-hand corner and go from counts to radiance. Yeah, counts to radiance. Yep. Now you're calibrated. And then if you look in the corner, on day one, we were at 3.7. On day two, 2.5. And on day three, 1.8. So it's decreasing. But I always say, if I show this to a child and say, hey, what's happening? It's the same. It's the same. They all look the same. If I show this to an oncologist and I'm like, hey, look, there's two times seven, seven, two times seven, six, two times seven, five, they're like, oh, that's you all. Right? If I show this to an MD, PhD, they're like, they all look the same. Right? So I have to make this simple for a child or simple for an MD, PhD. Right? So let's do that. If we come over here to image adjust and we unselect individual. Ah, day one is large, day two is medium, and day three is small. But I need you to show this to my child so they understand, right? So you see the minimum bar right here? <clears throat> Move that over to the right, watching day three. Keep going. There you go, stop. Ah. Now, an MD PhD will understand what this is. Prologue. Right? Depends on the It does. <laughs> okay, so let's even make it more simple for them. If I go options, layout, dynamic, and then I pull this corner right here and pull it to the left. Day one, day two, day three, and then I could export this and put it in my poster. Or I could have treatment group A versus treatment group B versus treatment group A plus B. Or I can take this corner and drag it over this way. <coughs> yeah. There you go, nice and big, come down. I wanna see it, there, beautiful. So, day one, day two, day three. Looks good, right? Mm -hmm. Let's put this in our poster, man. Let's put this in our presentation. You're doing great. <laughs> right? Yeah. All right. Click that button right there. Mm -hmm. Export graphics. So right, now we right can, paper with images included. Now yeah. we can save it, right? So if you go to the D drive and go to the hobby folder, and now you can save it as a PNG or bitmap, JPEG, PostScript, TIFF, TIFF. Because Nature Magazine will only accept TIFFs. Yes. So you better go only in nature, sir. Only in nature. Only in nature. <laughs> that's, that's very nature. Natural. Um. 
Okay. All right. So we have our day one, we have our day two, we have our day three, we have our pretty picture. Now we need numerical data to go along with it. So in order to get numerical data, we have to quantify surface radiance. In order to quantify surface radiance, we have to draw an ROI. So how do we draw an ROI? And here you can draw a circle, a square, a grid, or a contour. The fourth one over, the contour. Yeah. Okay. Auto all. Pop, 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 pop. Oh, man, it's only done the right lung. Oh. At a threshold percentage of 51%, it went to the peak and only went down halfway. But if you lower that to, like, 3%. Well, what it actually did is, it's not an MD PhD. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a computer scientist, right? So it's smart. If you click on full scale, you'll see what it did, right? Click on full, full scale. So uh, click on auto or something, maybe. There you go, perfect. So that's what it did. It actually saw a lot of signal everywhere, right? And it has no problem doing that. And you actually see here, can you read this? On day one, we're at 1.3, and on day two, 0 0.8, and on day three, 0 0.6. So we're decreasing. And so we can see visually and numerically how we're changing over time. Does that make sense? Okay. Is there a way, I mean, that I can do this threshold thing, like by excluding, for example, if I decide to exclude like less than 1,000 uh, or so I would have it correspond with the visual right so if you raise the minimum bar up now stop all right now raise the ROI up just to an arbitrary value yeah sure stop. Uh, maybe a little more oh, yeah like 10 okay, so or 11 mind yeah yeah oh we're really close right and then right. you come back down to like 11 or 12 yeah that's that's maybe that okay. But you're basically doing a determination of the area of a bell curve, mm -hmm. probably. So when you do the area of a bell curve and you start at the first percentile and you go to the 99th percentile, the area is A squared, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what if we go to the 10th percentile and the 90th percentile? Did we, did we lose 20% of our area? Mm -hmm. No, are we at 0.8 A squared? No. Not even close, right? We're at 0.95 A squared, right? What if we go to 20 and 80? Did we lose 40% of our area? Uh, no, no, we, we didn't, right? We lost 15% of our area. Whoa, so if you go way out with your ROI and it doesn't increase, no problem. Okay. If you go way out with your area and it keeps going up, Guess what, buddy? You have metastases all over that mouse. Okay. You're not seeing them, but you have a met burden everywhere in that mouse because it shouldn't be increasing. If it continues to increase and you keep making it bigger and it's going and going and going and going and going, stop. You need to take a better look at that mouse. Mm -hmm. Maybe you need to cover up the primary or maybe the next time Instead of you putting the primary tumor in the tail or putting the primary tumor in the peritoneal cavity, you put the primary tumor instead of a xenograft, you go in a distal paw. Yep. And if you go in a distal paw, then you can wrap it up with the black electrical tape and take another image. Mm -hmm. Take a one second image, take a five minute image. Take an auto and take a three minute. And you take the paw, okay, and then you wrap the paw up and take that three minute image. And when you take the three minute image, you're like, oh crap, man, I have a lot of signal in my lungs. Mm -hmm. Then I'll send you the WhatsApp video of me pulling the mouse's tongue out, filling the mouse's lungs with the substrate, right? And you can try to do that. Mm -hmm. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, where you, that's what you were thinking, right? Yeah. That's okay, good. Yeah. Okay, we took three bioluminescent images on three different days. We saved them. We changed the metadata comments. 
we saved them in one folder, then we went to file and then browse, and we open it up in that folder. <coughs> you open up your images, you adjust the minimum, you adjust the maximum, you put them all in the calibrated units, you unchecked individual, and you put them all on one scale, you drew ROIs, you saved them, now we need to analyze, so all we do is we click measure ROIs, and it gives you this table. Now, this table is giving it to you in counts. I know, the, we'll, we'll move the monitor down. We'll run that. Yes. So, well, it's giving it to you in counts. So pull that down. You want radiance or photons, and these are the units you probably want. Yeah. If every image you're taking is field of view C, field of view C, field of view C, field of view C, then you can use total flux in photons per second. If you're going field of view A, field of view C, field of view A, field of view C, field of view A. Okay, then you want the Photons per second, per square centimeter, per steradian. You need the, the units of area in there. But otherwise, you don't need them. Okay? And then, if you want, like, the metadata, the date and time, the mouse number, because this is basically getting exported into Excel. Right? So, any of the metadata that you want to add, mouse number one, two, three. Right? So, you can have a red line for mouse number one and a blue line for mouse number two. You can add all of that here by clicking on configure. Or we could just, yeah, Password. so anything, no, you're fine. Anything the software knows and any of your metadata comments, you can add via the screen. Okay. Close. Let's take this, select all, copy, and then you can go to Microsoft Excel and paste it in. I, there should be Microsoft Excel in here. There's a, they don't have a disk anymore. They have a serial number that you type into the internet and it, it gives you the Excel. It's down there in that box. Additionally, there's five more seats of the living image software. So if you don't want to do your analysis here, you could do it elsewhere. Or if he's doing a project and he's working at one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, you're like, dude, go home, <laughs> right? Put it on his laptop, right? He can run it on his laptop. And then when he graduates or he's out of here, he returns that seat and gives it to the next postdoc. Okay. Next postdoc can take it over. As long as you're staying in the living image version four, you can update. So right now, for select systems, we have 4.7.3, not the system, right? You can always upgrade. When we go to five, you don't get any more upgrades, right? But you can always upgrade. So we, we update the software about twice a year, three times a year, four times a year, depending on how many bugs we find, or how much user feedback you give me. And you're like, I'm using it, I hate this, I want this, I want that, I hate this, I like this, blah, blah, blah. I'll send you to the webpage and you can just fill it out. And you can see what other um, engineers and other users are making recommendations for and give them votes. You get like 10 votes a month where you're like, I need this feature in a future version. Okay, and you, I'm not gonna teach everything in Excel. You know how to use Excel. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> At the end of the day, you wanna take your mouse out um, I use 70% ethanol or alcohol, this is 80%, that's fine. Um, I use 70%, I will take my manifold out, I'll put this into a spray bottle, and I'll spray the manifold out here. I try not to make a cloud of spray inside the machine, because I don't want it to get on the optics. So if you have a lens, a wipe, Kim wipes, you have Kim wipes? Yeah, Kim wipes. Yeah, um, I'll take the Kim wipes and I'll put it right here and I'll cover up the lenses and then I'll spray inside and I'll make, yeah, this way it won't, you know, you want it to evaporate. Um, so if you spray ethanol, you let it sit and you don't wipe it away. Okay. It has to evaporate and when it evaporates, it'll lyse the cells. If you spray it and then you wipe it, you only get like a one log reduction. If you spray it and leave it, you'll get like a five log reduction. So spray it and just leave it. And I'll take my manifold out, I'll take my nose cones out, and I'll take this plastic out, I'll put them over here and I'll spray. Now we're done with bioluminescence. Do you have questions about bioluminescence? Are you happy yeah. so far? Yeah. Questions? Happy? With regard to training, not like spiritually happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Happy? No, the region of interest is different for each image, right? Yeah. So it's not, is there a way to select one sure. similar region of interest? Let's, let's do that. You have a seat. Right. 
So let's say, for example, we had three mice down on the stage. Close. Right? So we have three mice. So let's open up day one. Click, click. And now it gives us a few more options here. It gives us this option that says apply to sequence. Whatever we do on day one will be applied to day two and day three, which is fine. So click apply to sequence, and I want you to make three squares. One, two, three. And now I'm going to drag one over to mouse number one, drag one over to mouse number two, and drag one to mouse number three. Let's make this encompass the entire mouse. Uh, this is a Photoshop tool, so it should just click, click normal. But let's move that over to the right. This one? Yeah. Let's move it over to the right. All right. No, no, not like that. But like moving it. I wanted this mouse number. I wanted four, five, and six. But it's okay. Don't worry. Okay. You're good. Just move uh, five out of the way. Move five to over there. Perfect. All right. You see how my mouse isn't perfectly straight up and down? Mm -hmm. If you right click on that red line and say rotate and then move to the corner. And now you should be able to swing the corner around. Yep. Okay. And you get it good. Now, close day one. Double click on day two. I moved the mouse on purpose on day two. You can adjust the size and adjust the rotation, but you probably don't want to adjust the size. You want to adjust the location and the rotation without adjusting the size. It's good, all right? Now close day two and open up day three. And whatever we're doing on day three, apply to sequence is not checked, so it's only moving it on day three. Yeah, you got it. And now we're going to close that. So now you have the same size, and you can see. But now let's look numeric, right? 1.2 versus 1.35. 7.78 versus 8.72. When Javi drew this, he didn't make it at 3%. He raised it up to 17%, I think. If he had made it at 3% and we stuck at 3%, you'd be within like... 3% delta from overall to just the specific area. <laughs> and remember what I said, if it's not, and he makes the big ROI and it's hot, you've got burden somewhere else. Did that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Good. Why did you ask for three rectangles? You got another idea. Most people don't do one mouse at a time. Most people do five mice at a time or three mice at a time but nobody ever does, very few people ever do one mouse at a time. Uh, nature methods, papers, physics labs, they'll do one mouse at a time, but normally not. And the back one, the back one, which level do you put here? Five. Five. Oh, let's see. 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 And you're running one liter per minute. I see. No, I would run, but I try to run as close to the way I can. I can't get up to the front. You know, let's go to my Well, I like ten pickles from a safety standpoint. I am really afraid of ice and water. I don't like it. Um, and I try to minimize my exposure as much as possible. Because I think that it's probably You want to take another break? You want to get some lunch? You want to hop right into fluorescence? Break. Break. Yeah. All right. It's noon here how right long, now. How long does it take still for to talk about the fluorescence part and so on? What time do you have to inject your mice? One? They cut like in one hour, but I have to make sure some things before with the students, so I don't know if I have time. So, maybe 
it, it, it takes too long still. What time will you be done? I mean, with the measuring the mice, the students, they 